there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Well, welcome everybody to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. Man, it was a warm one yesterday and hopefully it'll be a warm one today. We're very excited that the sun is back in Alaska and uh, everybody's out on the Kenai River doing some fishing, which is pretty fantastic for the city of Kenai and city of Soldotna. If you do come fishing, remember to clean up your stuff and don't forget to shop at a couple of our shops here. Uh, we really appreciate you doing a little shopping and that sales tax help pays for our school. So we love that. Um, we want to thank our show sponsor, Gungerstein for Senate, for sponsoring the Must Beard Alaska show. Because of her sponsorship, we are able to get all the conservative news through all the nooks and crannies of Alaska, which is very exciting. And if you haven't downloaded our, <coughs> excuse me, if you haven't downloaded our app yet, we have a Must Read Alaska app, which is free for anybody to use. We put a lot of time, money, resources into this app and just make it available for anybody and everybody. Just go to your app store on the Android, on your Android phone or your iPhone and type in Must Read Alaska. The app pops right up. You can download it. It's a simple, easy, fast way to get our news without the clutter of a uh, World Wide Web, possibly. So um, we have a very special guest today, Diane, who's the president and CEO of the Rasmussen Foundation. We're very excited she's here with us. Uh, the Rasmussen Foundation plays a key role in Alaska, and we get to hear directly from her about the fun things going on at the foundation and what she's kind of proud of accomplishing over her tenure as being the president and the CEO. So without further ado, welcome to the Must Read Alaska show, Diane. Thank you. Great to be here. So glad you're here. So for folks, um, that uh, maybe are getting to know you for the first time. Tell us about how you first got involved in the Rasmussen Foundation. I'm sure folks would love to hear that story. Absolutely. I, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, and I came up to Alaska in 1983 to run Alaska Public Radio Network. And I had worked in radio for some time before that in Philadelphia and in California. And I was hired in part because they were looking to diversify the funding for the public radio network. At that time, uh, the State Broadcast Commission got a large appropriation from the legislature and they would give grants to the individual radio stations and TV stations. And then stations would pay dues to Alaska Public Radio Network. And that was the main source of funding. Almost all the funding came that way. And they knew they were vulnerable, depending on the will of the state and the economic times, to have so much of the budget for the radio network come from one source. So they were looking for someone to diversify the funding. And I had experience with radio underwriting, which is very uh, common now, but in those days was not. And uh, one of the first places I went to visit when I first came to Alaska was National Bank of Alaska because they had branches all over the state. We did news all over the state. We had 15 major radio stations and all the major markets where they had banks. And the VP of marketing told me no, because Ed Rasmussen, the president of the bank, didn't like radio. They never did radio and they were never going to do radio. <laughs> and I argued with him for quite a while. And he finally said, you know what? You're completely wasting your time. If you don't believe me, go see Ed Rasmussen. So I marched back to my office at the age of 26 and uh, picked up the phone. And I had, when I first came, people ask me, you know, you ask people, where should I get my hair cut? Where should I go to the dentist when you're in a new place? And a bunch of people had said, go to National Bank of Alaska for banking. And they liked the bank. And I didn't know anyone where I had lived before who liked their bank. So I was a customer. And uh, I dialed the number. It was 276-1132. I'll never forget that. And said, I'd like to speak to Ed Rasmussen, please. And next thing I heard was, Ed Rasmussen? 
And I was, <laughs> I was speechless because I didn't expect the bank president to answer his own phone. And I said, uh, can I have 15 minutes of your time this afternoon? I'm the new head of Alaska Public Radio Network. And he said, sure, come in. So I went in that afternoon and sold him $6,000 of (laughs) on Alaska News Nightly. And that's where it all began. So uh, a number of years later, we had gotten to know each other through my annual um, visits on underwriting. And I had heard about this little Rasmussen Foundation. You had to know somebody. There was no phone number. There were no guidelines. There was no address. (laughs) <laughs> um, you just had to hear about it somehow. And we had started getting these small grants from the Rasmussen Foundation every year. Our first fax machine was a Rasmussen grant. Our first computer was a Rasmussen grant. Our first digital tape recorder was a Rasmussen grant. These small two to 5,000. And you'd apply by October 1st, bring your proposal into the president's office. And then if you got a letter before Christmas, it was a yes. If you got a letter after New Year's, it was a no, because they didn't want to disappoint anybody around the holidays. So I usually got a yes. So we'd gotten to know each other there and through Rotary and uh, just having friends in common. A couple of my board members at Alaska Public Radio Network were his buddies, his Monday night football buddies. And um, some years later, I left public radio and started a consulting company in 1995. And I was reading the classifieds that summer and saw part-time administrator Rasmussen Foundation. And I thought that would be fun. So I called Ed. I thought I could do that maybe as a consultant, as part of my consulting practice. And I called him up and I said, hey, Ed, I see you're looking for someone for the Rasmussen Foundation. And he said, if you want it, it's yours. Nice. That was it. The rest so is history, I right? <laughs> to see this ad and happened to, you know, call and he didn't have anyone in mind. And I guess he thought I was okay. So that was that. And then years later, when Elmer Rasmussen was towards the end of his life and he and Ed had decided most of the family fortune would go to the Rasmussen Foundation, they realized that uh, they needed to start professionalizing it and getting someone to run it and all of that. So um, they asked me if I would come on full time and and run the foundation. So I was the first employee back in 1995. And I went full time in 2001, closed down the consulting company. One of the big issues was I needed health insurance. And uh, I got health insurance. It was me, (laughs) me, the pilots and the maids. We're in one health insurance group. So that's awesome. So it, so, it sounds like you've literally almost been there since day one in terms of you yeah. know, the first step. But it actually in- started in 1955. Jenny oh. Olson, who was a Swedish covenant missionary, she, uh, upon her husband's death, uh, he was the original owner of National Bank of Alaska. He had come as a missionary and then became a lawyer and fell into this banking business. Um, she created it with Elmer Rasmussen, and her son, when he died. A very modest. It started out as three thousand dollars. Oh wow! 1955. So for folks that don't know, you know how that started. You know if they've been uh, living in a rock, as I like, or under a rock, as I like to say. <laughs> tell folks about what the Rasmussen Foundation is. Sure. And kind of what they do. I think, um, you know, at least from my perspective, you guys are one of the biggest, if not the biggest, foundation in Alaska, and. You do a lot around the state, uh, but I think it's always good to remind sure. folks how wh- what you do and, and uh, who you are. Well, what communities hope is if they have individuals in their community who are very fortunate in business, usually, and make a lot of money, they hope that those individuals are going to see that the community in which they thrived had been generous to them and they want to give something back. So in many, all over the country, uh, it's a very American ideal, but not not exclusively, but a very American ideal. Uh, Often wealthy families uh, who have a charitable spirit or a spirit that they want to give back to the community that's been good to them 
will set up a private foundation. And Rasmussen Foundation was one of the early foundations set up in Alaska in 1955. The purpose was to uh, create an asset base with money that had been earned from the business, the family business, and have that grow over time and generate income that could be given out to good causes in the state. So Rasmussen Foundation as the only large general purpose foundation in Alaska to date, but hopefully not the only one in the future. Hopefully there will be others because there are other families who have also done very well in Alaska. Uh, started out with uh, church bonds, Presbyterian church bonds in 1955. Today, the foundation is around 750 million in assets. So that's money that was donated by Elmer Rasmussen in his will, and then by his wife, Mary Louise Rasmussen upon her death, and uh, some other small donations, but really all from the Rasmussen family. And those assets have been invested and grown. And each year we distribute approximately 5% so if you do the math at 800 million, um, of course, we've taken a, a bit of a haircut like everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but um, at 800 million, you would distribute by law, 5% would be $40 million. And that could cover any of your charitable expenses, your staff, um, but mostly goes out to other entities. So we fund all over Alaska. Uh, we try and be geographically dispersed and lots of different causes. There are very few things we wouldn't consider funding. That's awesome. So let's say if I'm a nonprofit and I'm listening to this yeah. show and I'm getting excited, I'm like, wow, I could, I could get some money. I got to, maybe I'm feeding the homeless yeah. or I'm doing kids backpacks for a school who can't, have, you know, who has a lot of kids on free and reduced lunch. Ta walk us through what does it look like for a nonprofit to engage sure. with the Rasmussen Foundation? We, we look at the whole landscape of where funding is available for different things. We work with a lot of different partners. So uh, there's another foundation attached to the Rasmussen family, the Atwood Foundation. That was the uh, sister of Elmer Rasmussen, her husband, Bob Atwood. They were the owners of the Anchorage Times newspaper. Uh, they left uh, money into a foundation as well. They fund in the Anchorage area, arts and education primarily. So if we're doing something in arts and education, it's not uncommon to do it with the Atwood Foundation. There's a foundation in the Matsu Valley called the Matsu Health Foundation. They were created when the nonprofit community hospital became a for-profit hospital and assets were put into a community benefit because that entity hadn't paid taxes to the borough all those years. And now the assets were becoming in going to private hands. So that's a typical thing that happens with hospitals or blue crosses that become for profit. Um, if we do something in the Valley, it's frequent that the Matsu Health Foundation will be part of that as well. So we look at organizations that we consider to be highly valued by their local community. And often what we look at is, do they have a lot of local donations from the people who enjoy their services? Do they have strong leadership uh, in terms of who runs the organization, the engagement of their board of directors? We look at if they are thrifty, careful, not cheap, but they're careful <laughs> in their use of resources. And uh, we wanna know, that they've been around for a little while. So if you just started a month ago, you're not likely to get our funding. You'd need to be able to show us some financial statements at least for a year of, of operation. We have very small grants that are available all year round, and that's a good place for a nonprofit to start. There what, are what do you mean when you say small? Are we talking 10,000, 5,000? Well, just to give somebody have, a picture, we have micro grants, we call them, <laughs> which would be usually under 5,000. Okay. Um, and these are administered by the Alaska Community Foundation, which operates lots of different funds. And they're mainly for activities to help the organization grow. So it might be to help them develop a fundraising plan, to help with a board 
uh, retreat to help them put together a strategic plan to help them have new software uh, to do uh, their accounting, those kinds of really basic needs that would move the organization ahead. And, and through the Rasmussen Foundation, we have tier one grants. They're under 25,000. 25,000 is a big grant in Alaska by any stretch, but for us, that's the limit of our small grants program. Most of those are for capital expenses. It could be playground equipment. It could be a roof repair. It could be a van for a senior program. It could be tables and chairs for a library. It could be a skateboard park. It could be anything that's a tangible item. And occasionally we'll do some other things like creative work, creation of a film, for example, or um, a website, maybe. Um, something critical to an organization. Then we do larger grants, over 25,000, and they can go up to, I'd say the largest is 12 million to wow. the, for the Anchorage Museum expansion. Um, but those are typically in the two to 300,000 range. And they're usually for a major priority of the organization. It could be capital, an expansion of a building or a remodel. Uh, it could be uh, a new program that's starting out that has good prospect of being maintained over the long term. So those are all sorts of things. That's awesome. Well, if you're a nonprofit listening, uh, take, take that in because if you have a board, you've been doing your work for a year or two years, three years, five years, and you have not yet approached the Rasmussen Foundation, um, I would encourage you to look into it because they have anything from the $5,000 grant to help you do a board retreat to <laughs> over $20,000, which for most nonprofits in Alaska would be a, a huge uh, shot in the arm in a good way. So one thing um, I didn't mention, John, is um, for especially for the larger grants, probably because this family was a banking family. You know, if you go into a bank for a loan, they want to make sure you have skin in the game. They don't want to just give you their money and hope for the best. They want to see you've invested your own money. In it. So, for example, if you're going for a mortgage, they want to know you're putting in that down payment so that you have a some risk attached to it. And you obviously believe in it if you're willing to take out a loan. So we have the same view when it comes to big projects for organizations. We want to see that the people closest to the project have contributed their own money to it. So if you come into us for a new building for the Awake Shelter, we want to see that that whole board of directors has made a financial contribution. We're not going to tell you it should be $100 or $500. Everyone has their own circumstances. For some people, $100 is a lot of money. For others, it's not. So we say an appropriate gift for you. We don't say what. But we want to see 100% backing of that project by the organization's leadership. Nice. So... Um, you've been the CEO president since I believe 2001. Is there one accomplishment that kind of sticks out in your mind in that um, tenure that you've been most excited about? One or two? Uh, gosh, I would say um, the profile of the foundation has gone up a lot. Um, more people know about it because we've been around longer, we've gotten a lot bigger. And I always um, felt that because we have the Rasmussen name on the foundation and because the family name has always been sterling in the state, in terms of being a family of integrity and generosity, that when I left, I wanted to make sure that reputation was absolutely in place. And I feel that it is. I think even we haven't done one of these research projects in a couple of years, but generally I think there's very favorable public uh, feeling about the foundation and the work that it does. And it's probably because of the work that it does that people see in the community. Um, I'm proud that um, we've funded so many different organizations in so many places. So I believe whether you're in Chivak, Alaska, you know, out way out in southwestern Alaska, or Metlakatla down in the south, or in Fairbanks, you feel that you have a good shot um, at getting support from the foundation if you have a sound 
idea in mind. And also that we're accessible. So I worked in public radio for many years. I never met a trustee of any foundation that funded us ever. Our trustees go all around the state. They meet people, they're out there, they're accessible. When you apply the Rasmussen Foundation, we say, don't send us a proposal in the mail and don't just go online and apply. Call on the phone, talk to someone, come into the office, meet with us, tell us what you wanna do. And we will tell you right on the spot if we think that's a good fit. We don't wanna waste your time or our time going through a process with something we never think will be funded. So tell us what you're thinking. We'll tell you right on the spot. Yes, that's a good fit. No, it's not. And if you send in a viable proposal, 95% of them get funded. I would say with many of my colleagues in the lower 48, 95% of proposals get rejected. Oh yeah. Just because they don't have that pre-process because they're too big and there are too many applicants. They couldn't do that. We're small enough in Alaska, we can do that. So hopefully once you get the, yeah, that sounds like a good project from a program officer, go for it because most likely you're gonna get that grant. So what are you excited about this year? I know that, um, uh, you know, hopefully COVID is kind of done. People are getting the, you know, doing projects again and meeting. And I'm sure that uh, the Rasmussen Foundation is as busy as ever, but what are, what are you excited about this year or in the near future for the Rasmussen Foundation? A couple of big um, initiatives of the foundation right now are homelessness, uh, the striving to end homelessness in Anchorage, Alaska, and now expanding uh, with statewide scope on our homelessness work and broadband. So briefly on homelessness, we've been at this for quite a few years with partners like Widener Apartments and Homes, uh, Primera Blue Cross, Providence, Talista, Doyon, uh, Wells Fargo, and other donors who are looking at truly ending homelessness in our local community. It may not feel like it because all the news lately has been negative about what's going on in Centennial Park and the uh, disagreements between the assembly and the administration in Anchorage, but truly we are one of the only cities on the West Coast that has kept our numbers of homeless people flat. Uh, we're not having the huge increases that have been seen. We have a very strong coalition to end homelessness in place now that we've all invested in. We have a business council, including everyone from ConocoPhillips to GCI to Siri, uh, to, uh, who are diligently working on policy and practices and be holding uh, providers as good partners and being accountable to get this work done. It is, there's one solution to homelessness, housing. That is the solution. We need a roof over the head of everyone who's willing to be housed. And we are working at it diligently. We hope to have another 132 units of housing online by the end of August, another 100 to 200 in September. So we're working through it. Um, the public um, unfortunately often sees the very few couple of hundred people who are the hardest to house, but we wanna house them too in the right situation. Families need one kind of housing. Uh, individuals need another kind of housing. Teenagers have covenant house. So there are different strategies for different population groups but the public is going to hear more about the successes. Right now, they're hearing a lot about some of the failures, uh, but that's when you do high risk work, there are successes and failures, that's what happens. On broadband, the state is going to announce very soon that Rasmussen Foundation has been selected to be its administrator of its digital equity plan. And what that means is there's $2 billion that will be coming to the state to make sure every Alaskan has broadband. Is this and the thing that uh, Jerry Ward was working on for a while or is this a different thing? I don't know. Okay. I know Jerry, but I don't know about that. Okay. Um, this is every state in the union will be getting a broadband allocation of funding as part of the uh, federal stimulus. And the idea is 
to have every Alaskan have access to affordable broadband. Um, part of the state's application is ensuring that eight specific population groups are consulted in how this broadband plan is put together so that when the money flows, these population groups, which are often overlooked, are taken care of. It's veterans, it's people incarcerated, senior citizens, people who have English as a second language, uh, rural people, people who are low income, people with disabilities. So it's a set group of people. And as the state's administrator, what we will be doing is working with partners who work with all of these population groups. And we do too, but often we work, for example, if we're working with people with disabilities, with Hope Community Resources, with the Mental Health Trust, um, with assets, with other nonprofit groups who work every day with people with disabilities. And we wanna make sure there are any specific issues they would have um, are taken into account when the state starts uh, putting its own plan for distribution of broadband. So we're really um, pleased that the Commissioner of Commerce selected us, asked us to take on this role. It fits very well into our core beliefs about really to be a citizen of the world, you've got to have access to high-speed broadband for jobs, for information, for dialogue, for education, for healthcare. It really, uh, broadband more and more going forward will be required to take advantage of what's available to people. And uh, right now, Alaska is 50th of all 50 states on access to affordable broadband, which means if you live in Anchorage or Fairbanks or Kenai, even though you have access to broadband, it's not considered affordable by national standards. So it may be available, but it doesn't mean you can afford to buy it. So the idea is to come up with strategies to make sure every Alaskan can have it just like we did with telephones, where we had universal telephone service as a, as the, as a, requ a requirement in this country. We will do- nice. this. Bring some of that internet out to Nikiski because we got the, <laughs> We have horrible internet out here, so. Yep. Well, Even you know I, what I mean. Oh yeah. It's pretty annoying, isn't it? Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah. I we only could do the satellite internet for a while, and that that's only good for about two days a week, and then. Yep. Uh, luckily, the ACS said if you have a business at your house, we'll give you business internet. So I was able to sneak some business yeah. internet in Nikiski, but you most people in Nikiski don't have internet, good internet. So yeah. it just goes to show that it it's not only bad internet doesn't just happen to folks that live in, you know, rural Alaska up north. It's right. on the road Absolutely. system as well. It's not that great in my office, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> in, middle, in Midtown Anchorage. So, um, and then there certain strategies are exciting. For example, with a previous commissioner of, co of corrections, uh, we talked about the fact when people who are incarcerated are getting ready to be released from jail, let's say when they're a year away, They've served their time for whatever it is. The, the community, the state has an interest in making sure that they stay out of jail. Once they're out, they're out, right? Nobody wants them going back to jail, committing another crime and so on. And there's a lot of, of theory and research that shows the more you can acclimate prisoners. Oh, dance party. Yeah. The more you can acclimate um people incarcerated to real life, outside life, before they get out, the more likely they are to be successful. So the idea was, let's get iPads for um, people who are incarcerated uh, in their last year. And many of them are far away from family and have an hour or two on Sundays or whatever day where they can FaceTime with their kids, their you know family, their parents, whatever. Yeah. And having that, since many of them don't get a lot of visits because they're far away from family, especially rural Alaskans, this would be a really good way um, to get people into dialogue. You could also, if you had people who are incarcerated who have had issues with alcohol and need um, support, get them into AA groups while they're still incarcerated. So they'll continue that practice when they get out. All kinds of exciting things that you can do 
using broadband technology. So that's awesome. So uh, last question to you is this, I think I read somewhere, it might have been a press release from the Rasmussen Foundation that um, that there is a search for a new CEO. So yes. um, it sounds like um, you're 27 year tenure there is coming to an end, you know, sometime in the next year or so, probably whenever yes. you guys find a, a a replacement. But uh, is there anything that you'd like to, um, you know, what kind of legacy do you hope to have left when you look back on your 27 years with the Rasmussen Foundation? You know, let's say you're sitting at your, uh, you know, uh, on vacation in Hawaii, sipping a Mai Tai, thinking about uh, the 27 years you put in with the Rasmussen Foundation, what's that legacy look like to you and what do you hope to to leave as you look back? Thanks for that question. I hope that um, the reputation of the foundation um, will make it uh, an organization that people want to be associated with long into the future. I believe that our um, efforts to reach out all across the state and to truly be an Alaska organization that reaches every population, every geography of Alaska is recognized and appreciated. And then um, all of the organizations that we've worked with over the years that do such great work they're really the heroes. So their success is our success. Last night I was at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. Um, when they did their first fundraiser that I was part of, I don't know, maybe it raised $80,000. There is $550,000 last wow. night. Wow, that's some serious money right there. Any, any candidate for Senate would be happy to raise that in one night. I will yeah. tell you that. Um, so... Uh, they have gotten so um, embedded in the community, not just in Anchorage, but across the state during COVID with all of their online work and tours online and their cultural tourism work. And we've been part of that organization since day one, helping them build organizations like the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program, like Covenant House, like Catholic Social Services, like Coeric out in Gnome, like Sea Alaska Heritage. These are major institutions in their communities, reaching thousands of people, doing good work every day with great leadership. And when we've found those organizations, we've helped them advance. And, and when they've got great vision, provided the capital to see them through. So it's really through those organizations and their success and their impact. That's really the impact of Rasmussen Foundation. We just write the checks, they do the hard work. And we recognize that. We're not full of ourselves. Uh, we know that um, uh, money is just money. You can have a great idea, but unless you have wonderful people to implement, it doesn't mean anything. And uh, legacy is my staff because I will be leaving behind a fabulous group of people who are talented, who are caring, who are compassionate, who are smart, who uh, really, really want to make a difference in the state. That's why they work with us. And they will long after I'm gone. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on Must Read Alaska. And for folks that are uh, tuned in or just tuning in, uh, listen to the story here in this uh, uh, Must Read Alaska episode. One of the fascinating things I just kind of picked up on was, you know, folks wondering, how do I make a difference? What can I do? This foundation started, I believe, in 1955, as I heard it correctly from Diane, with $3,000. And so you can make a difference, folks. This is, you know, some 70 years later, and now they're $800 million foundation. This foundation was just started with 3000 bucks. So everybody out there, uh, instead of thinking about what you can do and wondering why you can't do something, just start. And if you are a nonprofit out there and you've been around for a year or so and you got a board and you are wondering how the heck do we get to the next phase and what you're trying to do, get in touch with the Rasmussen Foundation. They help everybody from giving a $5,000 grant to over 20,000 bucks. It's not a guarantee thing, but you never know till you ask and pick up the phone and make a phone call. So thank you so much for joining us on the Must Read Alaska show, Diane. I appreciate it. And um, for
for those of you listening in, we also want to thank our show sponsor, Gungerstein for Senate, for sponsoring the Mustard Alaska show. It's because of our sponsorship, we're able to get conservative news for all the nooks and crannies of Alaska. If you like your apps on your phone, make sure to get Must Read Alaska app. You can download it for free at any app store. And if you listen uh, to this podcast, feel free to shoot us a review. Uh, and if you uh, if you uh, listen to uh, if you listen to us on Spotify or Google Play or you know the list goes on, you can review any of those any of those sites. We really appreciate you leaving a review because that helps us get our show out a little more organically to all the folks that listen. And uh, until next time, from somewhere in Alaska, we're going to have Charlie Pierce on the Monday show with Suzanne and I, uh, Mayor Pierce, who's running for governor. You won't want to miss out on that uh, to hear about how his campaign is going. So we hope everybody has an awesome weekend and stay safe out there and good luck fishing on the Kenai for folks that are fishing on the Kenai. Thanks so much.